I had always loved westerns when I was growing up and shared that love with my brother. He had probably shown me the first westerns I'd seen and we had watched many, many westerns as we were growing up. And when I became a director, I, it was always clear to me that I, I wanted to make a western. I love the terrain, I love the country, I love the way it looks, I like the horses, the guns, the, the costumes, the cowboys, I love the issues that come up in westerns, I love the heroic figures that cowboys can represent, gunslingers. I love everything about the vitality of that period in our history. The westerns were very much out of style at that time. They had gone completely out of favor and generally have had a spotty commercial record since, with a few exceptions. But we wanted to remind people of the pleasures that we had had from westerns growing up. This was about loving all the elements of the western, all the surfaces. In a way, it's a postmodern western because it's very much aware of its antecedents and tries to use them in ways that are fun and interesting. He had done body heat on a very carefully calculated and well-judged small canvas, the chill rather bigger. He was ready to do something quite large and uh, he wanted to do a western. He knew that I shared his enthusiasm and he very kindly asked me to write it with him and I wound up being an associate producer as well. Well, Larry had the spirit of the thing in mind and I agreed completely, the thematic material. He had a few strong images to begin with. Uh, for instance, finding Kevin Klein in his long johns and following the motif of his regaining his horse, his hat, and his gun, and also the concept of multiple heroes, of weaving multiple storylines. Those, those were bits and pieces that Larry already had. We didn't really have the overall shape at the beginning, but as we began to assign values to this or that kind of sequence and began to think about the kinds of people we wanted to be dealing with, it weaved together relatively quickly. A great many Westerns had been made in Europe in that time period because it was cheaper, but there's not one of them that really looks like America. I scouted in Arizona and New Mexico and Utah, but we were going in the middle of winter. We knew it had to be one of the southern western states, and when I saw New Mexico, I knew that was it, but I fell in love with it. The light was unlike any light I had ever seen. The landscape is spectacular. It's red cliffs. I went back there later and made wide herb in the same area. It's a very popular location, which has now been used probably a hundred times in the last 13 years. We had a camera up every day who took like, a, I don't know, a shot a day. So, it, I mean, I'm sure it took a couple of months, let's say, to build it, probably three months, you know, and it snowed a number of times. I, sometimes I couldn't go outside, the wind was howling so badly, and we couldn't paint because, you know, the wind was blowing sideways. We rigged some of the buildings that we had put up, for example, the Midnight Star Saloon, to be usable as sort of rough and ready sound stages. They were not, in fact, soundproof, but out there, except for the rare plane passing over, we just didn't have the sound problem. As long as, long as we cut our own vehicles moving around, it was quiet enough. The back walls of the saloon were wild and we could open those up and build smaller sets in a space behind there, and we could hold the extras there. That became a very important space. The fireplace was practical. We had it on all the time because it was cold. So we, we used that as a saloon and had a number of small sets built behind it that changed. It was something Larry and I really wanted to do. We wanted to dolly a lot. The terrain was very difficult. It was very complex, sometimes setting up you know, long extended dolly shots because you know, the sands would collapse and things like that. More than any other film I think I've ever done, it was the most labor intensive film. The amount of work by the crew to go into getting a very simple shot was mind boggling. I've never been through anything like it. It's very much like you imagine John Ford Westerns or the Howard Hawks Westerns from the 40s and 50s. You see production stills of the arcs and everything on these huge rubber 
tired dollies. And you know, we found out we ended up doing the same thing. Our Wranglers, a lot of them had tremendous kind of film, filmography and history. They'd tell, sit around, you know, between setups, telling stories about Hawks and Ford and Raul Walsh. And I mean, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was really fascinating. We had something called the TerraFlight, which was essentially a camera on an arm with a kind of gyroscope. Whether you have this TerraFlight or just a regular camera truck, you need some relatively smooth road that runs parallel to where your people are riding. And there can be no sign of any road anywhere in the area. So you have to actually make roads where there are none based on what you want to see in, in the foreground and the background. And so it takes enormous care. It rained not too many days earlier than that, and the ground was still super saturated and wet. And it was very uneven going. But the TerraFlight did allow us to begin just after Thanksgiving and shot until the middle of March. We were in New Mexico in part looking for milder weather than we might have found farther north. It's been uh, challenging, cold. It's made everyone maybe a little tougher than they are. And I think in that way, it, the, the elements have worked to our advantage because there, there is a hard feeling uh, through which the warmth of certain situations or characters uh, comes through, but it, it has to be, hard, it's hard earned when it does because the, the environment has not been terribly sympathetic to our needs and we've had to, to battle them at times. Uh, but I find that invigorating. It adds an edge to things sometimes. When we, we came in close on Danny Glover's family's burnt out homestead, which is now overrun with cattle, the set was so covered with snow that you couldn't really see that it was supposed to be a burned out cabin. And so we were delayed a little that morning while uh, they were uh, blowtorching it off. As cold as it's been, as much mud as I tramped through, just allowed me to, uh, to experience some things I hadn't thought I'd ever experience as an actor and, and part as, as a human being, you know. I was the one warm person the scene standing the the during off, the entire the scene. Here. He's rotating oh, less well. He's not a trooper. No. We had a large group of the actors in the rehearsals, not just the four leads. It was also, you know, Brian Dennehy and Linda Hunt and Rosanna. And it was a very interesting period, as rehearsal periods always are. Larry does a great job in the rehearsal period, and I was privileged to be there. Usually, the actual text does not change much. Uh, what happens is that the actors find the three-dimensionality behind the line, and I never cease to be amazed at how they can take a line that you wrote one way and say those words and have it mean what you need it to mean for the plot, and at the same time turn it so that there are three other meanings, three other emotions involved. And that's really what went on in the uh, rehearsal period. There was a lot of bonding between the four the protagonists. It helped a lot that they got to know each other, both in rehearsal and during a period of training we had for them where they, uh, they spruced up their riding skills and their shooting skills, and they were all working together. It helped, I think, when we came to shoot to make them into a uh, convincing team. In rehearsals, Larry spent a lot of time talking about Silverado really being about family and how people find that for themselves, how they arrange that a support system in their lives. Ojala was the gun advisor and quick draw expert. He had been famous since I had been you know, an eight-year-old. Uh, I used to see him on television. He had trained uh, James Arness for Gunsmoke and all the cowboy series that I grew up with. He was quite an old, elderly man by this point, but still completely active and very good. He said, now this is Arvo Ohala. He'll be teaching you fast draw. He's one of the greatest fast draw teachers in the world. And Arvo was, this, was a great teacher, but I'm going, what is this Finnish guy doing in the Old West? Well, he taught Paul Newman in The Left-Handed Gun, and he taught Jack Palance. And I remember one day, I mean, he was talking about speed. He said, go for your gun, and I will go for my gun, and I will get off, I'll fire off two rounds at you before you even get your gun out of your holster. I went, 
oh, come now, I don't think I'm quite that slow. And we squared off, and sure enough, before my hand got to the holster, he had killed me twice. So he was fat. Wears a sword at his waist uh, is the sign and symbol of that complete responsibility. On the other hand, the tradition of Westerns that we were harking back to had a certain kind of cleanness to the hits. You know, somebody takes a bullet and goes down, and there is a stylization there beyond any question. It's not a realistic, gritty depiction of the horror of dying from gunshot wounds. You can tell that it hurts when someone's hit. You can tell that they've been punctured when they're shot. But there's no slow motion luxuriating in the blood spurting. And, and we know, in reality, how horrible those things can be. We see it on the news every night, but they're very, I don't, they're not glamorized, and I don't believe they should be. But as I pointed out to Larry, I kill about 26 people in this movie. I hate that kind of gratuitous violence. He said, I just saw you play Henry V last summer, and you wiped out the entire French army. Don't you see that it's not about I'm not going to glamorize this. We thought about that and realized that kids were going to see this movie and think that they could get away with pretending to hang themselves and that that might well be dangerous. And so we rewrote and, and Jake's later disappearance is explained as having fallen off a horse. He's trying to get away and fell off his horse. Which is implausible with his riding skill. But we were conscious it was going to be a family. The action and when it's all over and he's vanquished the bad guys, he steps outside and he's in this incredible place in New Mexico. We storyboarded that sequence and we wanted to know how the light would enter the cabin as the bullet holes came in and the fellow falls through the roof. But a lot of the uh, material that you see there was, was done over a period of weeks. Uh, we essentially tore that shack down, took it back to Silverado and where Kevin, who, who did the stunt himself of jumping onto the Pinto's back during the jailbreak, there, we needed multiple doubles because the horses quickly learn that somebody's going to land on the back and they tend to shy, you know, and you have to change horses. On days when we were riding the horses, they had to drag us off those horses at the end of the day. We loved it, especially Scott Glenn and I. We'd always want to run the horses. And they said, hey, you got to rest the horse, you got to rest the horse. We'd always want to just sort of gallop off and jump over things. And, we loved our horses. You know, I started this movie, I could barely knew which side of a horse to get on. Now I could ride horses. And I don't say that with too much ego, but I can ride. Show me a horse and I'll ride him. We had to learn for that, for that one shot where we're riding four in tandem. It's a very difficult thing to do to get it just right. I'm gonna put my hat on the horse. And it was totally goofy and very much in character for Jake. Costner was full of ideas like that. This was at a time when Kevin was just beginning to emerge as a star. This movie really made him the star he was, but he had it all in him. And he was full of ideas that just would highlight or flavor the character, make him a little bit funnier, a little bit goofier, a little more daring, a little more exciting. And everyone contributed things like that. That's what you expect. When you work with good actors, you expect them constantly to be suggesting things. And what you're hoping is that those you accept work out, and the ones you reject, they don't sulk about it. We storyboarded the stampede, which is very complicated. It's very hard to get cattle to stampede. It's very hard to have them go in the right direction. It took much longer than we thought it would. The sequence sort of worked finally, but it was really patching it together with little pieces. 